He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. They say life is stranger than fiction. Our brains are full of neurons and these individual nerve cells all communicate together and that collective set of neurons can do things that individual neurons can't do. But sometimes what we see in movies or read in books is so incredible that it obviously couldn't be possible. Or could it? There have been some very interesting AI things, so things done in software, where people have tried to write computer codes that are capable of improvising. Why do I not like that idea? Hi, I'm Brian Crump, and you're listening to Sci-Fi Sci-Fact, a podcast where McDiamond Institute scientists fact-check popular science fiction. In this episode, Professor Bill Williams, McDiamond Institute Principal Investigator and Professor in Biophysics and Soft Matter at Massey University, discusses Axonite from Doctor Who with Melody Thomas. The Doctor's Axonite is a thinking matter that can replicate any substance and spread itself across the cosmos. Sounds like trouble. We offer a gift, Axonite. The tremendous advantages for humanity in Axonite. And unlimited power. We must have it. Axonite is bait for human greed. I can't remember this episode because although I was a sort of avid Doctor Who fan when I was a, a kid and kind of grew up on that, I think probably that helped me develop some sort of interest in science. Um, it's quite an old episode, but I think the, the basic idea is that there's a material which essentially um, kind of perpetuates itself and kind of, let's say, uh, sucks all the energy out of the environment in which it finds itself. So it's a, it's a material which can essentially think and replicate, and in doing so it kind of starts taking over. A little bit like, I guess, a modern-day equivalent would be if people have read uh, Prey by Michael Crichton or something like that. So, The idea of, of Axonite and a material that thinks and has motives and, yeah. and that kind of thing, are such materials possible? I think probably it's worthwhile to just spend a couple of seconds saying what we mean by thinking because... You know, if I was a philosopher lecturer, we could spend a long time probably debating what we mean by the word thinking. But I tend to think that in um, sort of everyday speak, we tend to use thinking in two separate ways. So one might be just using the word thinking to mean, can whatever it is that you're asking, is it thinking? Can it perform a computational task? So in other words, you know, can it do two times three equals six? I mean, that's just sort of a simple computation. And you might say if you wanted to, that things that can do that are thinking. You know, they're able to do some rudimentary mathematics, for example. The other time we tend to use the word thinking is perhaps in a more contemplatory process. So sometimes, you know, we want to think about things where we, you know, consider them, and these processes tend to take longer. And, you know, sometimes you might, you might try and remember something and you can't remember it, but then an hour later it kind of pops into your mind. So... There seem to be, in, in my way of thinking about it, just for the discussion, these two different sorts of things. Can things perform computational tasks which are useful to them and help them live? Or can things, I've forgotten the word you said a minute ago, well, you, you, these kind of ideas of having more contemplatory things. Clearly there are materials that fulfil both of these, um, like your brain, for example. So your you know, biological things are still made out of matter and they still obey the laws of physics. Um, You know, while several hundred years ago we might have thought that lots of scientists thought that biological systems were somehow innately different from from inanimate objects and people talked about them having a life force and these kind of things. Modern biophysics doesn't really have any evidence for that. It believes more that the properties of the biological systems we see, um, while they're they're super interesting and we want to understand how they emerge, we don't think you kind of have to add anything else, if you understand what I'm saying. So if you understood, you know, the laws, the physical laws that govern matter, 
within that should be the potential to make something that thinks because we know our brain can do that and we don't feel that biological things are over and above physical law. So your brain is an example. A collection of neurons can definitely do thinking. There are some organisms which also clearly have to carry out computations like optimization procedures, for example. Jellyfish uh, might look around them and decide, you know, am I going to go off in this direction to look for food? Or, you know, what am I going to do if I dry out? Or things like this. There are things that can do those sorts of computation which actually have very few neurons, like a jellyfish. One of the funny things about a jellyfish is it hardly has any neurons. It has maybe a few hundred neurons compared with our billions. Um, or if you go back to a sponge even, so a, a sea sponge, a sea sponge has no neurons at all. And in fact, a plant. Um, there was some lovely work published a couple of years ago showing that the way in which a plant opens the... You know, plants have kind of pores on the bottom of their leaves, which they open and it helps with gas transfer, but also um, it dries out the leaf, basically, so moisture can get, get out when they open these. So plants are all the time kind of deciding how many of my pores should I open and how much should I open them. And it turns out that if you study that process, you can clearly show that it's a computational process in the way, we, in the way that we would define it. So that means the plan is doing an optimization procedure using some sort of computation. But then again, it doesn't have any neurons like a sponge doesn't. Um, and you wouldn't say, probably, you wouldn't say that a sponge or a, a plant was conscious. Maybe some people would, but you wouldn't probably say it was conscious to the same degree as humans. I haven't seen the, uh, I think it's a, maybe four parts actually that they yes. explore this yes. um, and I haven't seen all of it but I've, I have seen some parts of it and I know that there are axons which are, you know, the humanoid kind of form of it. It, mm. it, it kind of replicates itself in a bunch of different ways but is all part of the one larger organism, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Mm. And that's, I guess, a little bit like the Borg in Star Trek. You know, resistance is futile and all that, where basically uh, the individual parts of a whole, but essentially the way in which they function is determined by them interacting with the hive mind, if you like. I guess that's an idea that's been in science fiction for a long time as well. Okay. So I think there's kind of several ideas in the idea of axonite, really. There's one about sort of whether materials themselves can think and what that might mean and how materials replicate themselves. And there's also this idea that the functioning organism can be a collection of smaller parts, if you like, where each of the smaller parts can have a certain amount of autonomy, but also the organism as a whole functions by actually exploiting communication between the bits. Definitely that kind of idea has some sort of origins in in the natural world that we see around us. I mean, clearly things like bees as well, which I guess where hive mind comes from, you know, and, and ant colonies where different individual ants and bees will have a different role in a collective environment. I mean, you can see just by looking at, you know, humanity that essentially, you know, if you were to say what are the most... Um, you know, amazing things you think that humanity has done in terms of advancing our understanding of the world and developing medicine and such like. I mean, I'm not saying that in any way, you know, we're a hive mind in the sense of that, but it is, it is through collaboration and communication. I mean, we're all individual human beings, but no one human being, you know, really... It's very rare that one human being, you know, makes a massive breakthrough. Um, sometimes that happens, but it's essentially, you know, that we build incrementally, right, on what other people do. So um, the, the idea that the parts, uh, sometimes you can have a, a whole that's bigger than the parts, I think is a very, also a sort of a very common theme that this kind of, the kind of science fiction aspect's more kind of spooky, like, oh, how do they know what each other are doing? And it's kind of like they're overseen by some sort of uh, omnipotent power that's directing them. But in terms of a collection of individual parts, being able to do things that the individuals themselves can't do, um, that's actually a very clear idea in, in science and in physics in particular. And we tend to call these things something particular. We call them emergent properties because... They're not properties of the individuals of the group, they're properties of the group itself. Are there other examples of these emergent properties being displayed in humans? In humans? Well, I guess one of the most um, uh, debatable ones. So um, I would say this is, 
controversial is probably the wrong word because I think we still know too little about it. But I mean, this this goes to the the heart of another question that we perhaps discuss, which is you know what does thinking and computation and such like mean? And uh, some scientists have the idea that our you know that our very consciousness, our consciousness is essentially an emergent property. In other words, our brains are full of neurons which are individual nerve cells, and these individual nerve cells all communicate together. So in the human brain, there's a ridiculous number, like I think it's something between 10 and 100 billion of these cells, and they're all communicating and talking to one another. Um, that collective set of neurons can do things that individual neurons can't do. And some people would argue even that you know, consciousness itself is an emergent property. I wouldn't say that's universally accepted because I think um, there's different ways you can study consciousness and certainly it's one of those things that is still a bit of a frontier that there's lots and lots of questions about that we still don't understand. You're going to know better than me where this thought is leading and hopefully you can just take it and run with it. But I guess I'm, I keep thinking, you know, if we're looking at carrying out a computation versus consciousness or thinking, yeah, something that comes to mind is improvisation yeah so looking at uh you know roots and maybe choosing this is the best one say something jumps up that gets in the way and means you have to change your mind like is is that a difference between consciousness and computation is the ability to improvise and do something new <laughs> that's that's a fantastic question and um i mean i'm not an expert on that either i can tell you what i think but i could be completely wrong so i definitely think that those kind of creative processes, let's call them. So, you know, when you have an idea, for example, or as you said, when you um, improvise to something, you would tend to think that that's a different thing than simply performing a computation. Um, there have been some very interesting kind of AI things, so things done in software, where people have tried to write computer codes that are capable of improvising. So, for example, there are... Um, kind of computer codes people have written that try and compose music or produce art and things like that. The creative process could be something you know quite different from a sort of an optimization computation. It might be a very different sort of thing going on. But I think there's still reasonably good evidence to suggest that you you could still capture that in a in let's say an artificial substrate that wasn't. A biological one. Why do I not like that idea? I think you don't like that idea because we think that as humans there's something about being creative that's very satisfying and you do feel something which is um, I don't want to use very emotive words but you, you know when you do something creative you kind of feel that special to you and it's connected with your consciousness and I think you don't like the idea that there could be something that wasn't um, that wasn't human. <laughs> I mean, you might be even upset if we, you know, if you were to show that lower animals could do it to some extent. I mean, as humans, we want to say what's different about us. You know, why are we king of the king of the jungle kind of thing? And I think that's, you know, we can we tend to think it's to do with that. It's to do with our consciousness and the ability to abstract problems and things like that. That's why it's perfect for science fiction, right? People are unnerved by the fact that potentially there could be other materials which could eventually perhaps manifest some properties um, that we think are special to us. So if you look at one of my favourite films ever, Blade Runner, right? So Blade Runner's a movie all about what, what makes us different being humans, and if you could make an android that was like a human, then... You know, what rights does it have and how should I view the android versus how I view myself? So don't get me wrong here. <laughs> We're a long, long, long way away from making anything that does that kind of computation. What we can do now is we can look at materials which can do that set of tasks which are essentially just what we call computational tasks. So we could think of building devices, for example, that are very good at pattern recognition, and, you know, you might kind of um, 
put this device in front of a cat and maybe it turns red, and if you put it in front of a dog, it turns blue. So that's clearly a computational task. It's recognising a pattern and responding according to that pattern. But you're perhaps a little bit less scared about that because you sort of feel that's a very sort of clockwork computation and you, you don't mind that mechanical systems can do that. It's at this point that your notes, to me, start getting more unrecognisable to me. So you're going to have to lead me through and lead the listener through a little bit. You, yep. you mentioned self-replicating materials. Can you tell me a little more about what you mean about that and in this context? Sure. So I think the first thing we really talked about, the idea of um, materials thinking and what we tried to do is examine a little bit the different ways in which you can, uh, you know, what thinking might mean. And what I tried to say is that some classes of that thinking, those computations, optimization um, devices, which we find all over in nature, there's no reason to suggest that they definitely need neurons. Neurons is a great system to study. But we can build artificial systems that do that. And there's people in McDiamond Institute looking at these materials, which try and compute a little bit more like the brain does. So these are called neuromorphic materials. So there's investigators like Simon Brown down at Canterbury and some great stuff looking at how you might make a system which is very, very different from a neuron. Um, it's actually a system of small conducting particles. But nevertheless, that he can get that system to show some behaviours that are similar to some behaviours that neurons show. And those systems might be used to do these things like pattern recognition in a very different way than how we do computations now. Now, when it comes to the, the Doctor Who thing, it's not just thinking that the uh, axonite does, it's also that it replicates itself. And to some extent, you can tell my, my kind of bent really is uh, as a physicist interested in biology, is to kind of look at biology and go, well, you know, we replicate ourselves, right? So essentially any, whichever, you know, whether you, whichever branch of the tree of life you're in, um, you know, whether you're a bacteria or, you know, a fungi or a, a human or a plant, part of our existence in the planet we inhabit is that we replicate ourselves. And if you sort of zoom down to, you know, the underlying what you might call the smallest um, divisible part of life, the cell. I mean, cells replicate themselves, right? It's an amazing thing that, you know, when uh, at the moment of conception, um, you know, two cells coming together and then dividing and replicating. And so the idea of self-replicating systems, certainly we're surrounded by self-replicating systems, in terms of having artificial materials that self-replicate, probably, again, we're not, we're not there yet, but certainly I don't see any reason why you couldn't go in that direction. For me, the biggest thing is to look at how systems that self-replicate now, how do they achieve that? These are things that we can understand, and then they can help us if we wanted to make a system that self-replicates. And why would we want to build more self-replicating systems? Like all those sorts of questions, it's really important that, you know, if we should do things is, uh, is a sort of the question where, you know, we need to involve society. I think the job of science is to learn things, to acquire knowledge. If you looked at why would we want to build self-replicating systems, well, we might want to have some kind of tasks where you might want, for example, small, um, small robots, essentially. Maybe you have dangerous environments where you want to send small robots, things that humans do now, which really will be better off if they didn't. Or you might want to go and explore space or something and send robots out there. And you kind of want a way that the agents you send out there, you want them to be able to take care of their own body, but also potentially to replicate for the same reason that we do, because things break. And mm. so you kind of want there to be some sort of redundancy. And because you've mentioned small robots and self-replicating, yeah. one last thing that I want to touch on was mentioned in your notes, and I'm curious to know where we're taking it, which was yeah. robot swarms, which, again, sounds slightly unnerving. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Please do maybe. reassure me. It's funny, isn't it, how swarm has become a word which has these, like, 
nasty connotation. You know, if we talked about the collective behaviour of birds as a flock and the collective behaviour of fish as a school, the collective behaviour of some insects a swarm, but somehow because I guess it's because some of the insects that swarm uh, you know, got stings. Will hurt you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so swarms sort of, uh, so you're right, we, we should probably not call them robot swarms. A flock of robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> A gentle uh, so school exactly of robots. Exactly the idea is that um, particularly if you are um, looking at miniaturising things, often when you miniaturise things, kind of back to what I was saying before, actually, just that groups of things can often do something more efficiently than one thing kind of micro robots that perhaps aren't common now but if we could understand how a group of them could be coordinated together mm. it's just the fact that you know they'd be able to do more useful tasks essentially i think i read an example of a small a robot that was sent to land on a, a comet or a meteor and failed to yeah. land whereas maybe five if five of them had been sent five smaller ones not only was there a greater chance of more landing but you'd have data from different sites on that yeah, exactly, exactly. One of the super fascinating things that I think has happened in science over the last number of decades is that we have more and more measurement tools and more and more manufacturing tools to be actually doing things in the micro stroke nano world. So obviously nanotechnology is kind of a big buzzword. And really it's just talking about, you know, us being able to measure things and design processes that happen on much, much smaller scales than we've been able to do traditionally. And I think having, you know, when you go down to those sorts of small elements, it really is just sort of, um, you know, many hands make light work, right? It's that if you want to do something at these scales, having coordinated motions of smaller things is a, is a much more efficient way to go. And also my own little take on this is with been into biomimetics. The amazing thing about biology is it's still, you know, the brain, our brain is purely, you know, a biological construct. And it, just look at what it can do. I mean, look at your, how that can compute. Look at how your retina can detect light. Look at how your DNA can store information. All these things are done amazingly well. And at the moment, still better than any man-made devices we've come up with. And yet, what are they made from? They're made from totally sustainable materials, right? They're basically made from the things around us in the environment. And at the end of their lifespan, you know, we get degraded by other things in our environment and go back and get recycled. So to me, the idea of moving towards having devices which can still give us that kind of, you know, high-tech medicine. It can still give us that scientifically informed world that's useful for humanity. But at the same time, if we can take a kind of a hint from the biomimetic stuff, we can do it in a way, I believe, which is going to be much, much more sustainable and is much more in tune with the planet. So as a way of finishing regarding the scientific feasibility of a material like axonite, a, a thinking and self-replicating material, I guess your answer is absolutely possible, but we're not there yet, yet there. There are existing biological systems which you could say from that sort of conceptual map do that. The question is, you know, should we construct some perhaps out of some material you're not expecting you know like so if we built something out you know silicon and do you know what i mean so mm. the question is you know could we can we and should we be making yeah these? yeah exactly yeah. but at the end of the day you've got to realize you know i mean biology i mean things are constantly changing in biology as you see i mean coronavirus right so that's you could be scared about the possibility of things but i don't think you should be any more scared than you should be anyway <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Sci-Fi, Sci-Fact, produced by Andrew Robertson, and of course, made possible thanks to the incredible knowledge of those brilliant scientists at the McDiarmid Institute. You can find more episodes of Sci-Fi, Sci-Fact on the RNZ Podcasts page. RNZ Podcasts are also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or pretty much wherever you might find your podcasts. And make sure to follow us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. <laughs>